All right, we can get started. So good evening, everyone. Thank you all for attending our event today. Uh, my name is Binesh Kumar. I currently serve as the chair for IEEE Charlotte section, Young Professionals Affinity Group. So this is our first event for 2022. Uh, the mission of our group is to you know, foster professional growth through networking, collaboration, and career development endeavors among young professionals in the Charlotte and IEEE Region 3 area and to bring the technical community a bit closer than where it is right now. So we have a variety of events planning planned out, uh, which I will go over towards the end of the session. Uh, but for today's agenda, I'll probably give a quick introduction of our speaker, um, and then we'll have our session followed by a Q&A session uh, for you to ask any questions that you might have during the events. Um, but you can also type out your questions on the chat window uh, so I'll start compiling all those towards the end. Uh, I can read it out if you don't want to um, speak up during the Q&A session. Uh, but one request I do have, uh, if you can, please turn on your cameras. So it'll be an interactive session. Um, so that's the request I have. Uh, we'll also take a picture during the event. Um, so it'll be really good to have your wonderful faces during uh, the event. Um, so that's one request I'm putting forth. And also, if you can mute yourself, if you're not talking during the session, that will help prevent any like feedback. But obviously, feel free to unmute um, yourself if you have any questions um, as well. So yeah, we are honored to have Joshua Tim as our speaker today. Um, just a quick bio about Joshua. Uh, he's a passionate teacher and a mentor who makes complex things simple. Um, having worked in the electric power industry as a protection and controls engineer for over like 15 years, the most rewarding part of his career has been the investments he's made into others' growth and development. So he loves to train on the technical complex sub subjects of the protection and controls field, uh, but he also loves to mentor others in career development, especially for junior engineers. Uh, many of his former mentees today are technical project leads, PM supervisors, managers. So we have the right person for our event today. So thanks, Josh, for taking the time and doing this event for IEEE. Um, Josh also started his own engineering training and consulting firm. It's called Power Transformations, um, which is focused on training PNC engineering leaders of tomorrow. He's a licensed PE and a senior member of IEEE PES as well. Um, so this... Um, topic today was actually picked by Joshua Tim uh, to have a little more generic um, and something that I've been passionate about is the concept of growth mindset uh, where it's it's like a lifelong learning you know once you get out of ac academia and even when you are at school you're not relying on others for your professional development it's a constant um, you know, learning opportunity in wherever you go, whichever field you end up with. So I think the topic today is like perfectly aligned with that. Um, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Joshua, Tim, um, and we can go from there. So Josh, it's it's on you now. Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you, Banesh, for that introduction. And I'm excited to share with you this evening, if you're on Eastern time zone like me, uh, on the subject that I'm quite passionate about, uh, mentoring and professional development. Uh, I want to thank Banesh and the IEEE leadership team uh, for inviting me to speak on this topic. And uh, I'm coming to you live today from Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, let's get a little bit of group interaction starting. If you can type in the Zoom chat window, uh, where are you tuning in from today? And also how many years of experience do you have in industry outside of, uh, out of the university? Um, if you're still a student, you can share that as well. So why don't you practice uh, interacting? I want this to be an interactive dynamic session and not just a monologue. So as uh, Banesh said, I encourage you to type questions along the way as they come to you in the Zoom chat window. And I'm going to periodically be reading uh, those questions as they come in. I might stop and open the floor at times to some questions, some Q&A throughout. Uh, that way you don't have to wait until the very end, the last five, 10 minutes to uh, ask those. Uh, I like to, to have that interaction in my sessions. So uh, um, uh, like Banesh said, I encourage you to turn on your videos. Would love to see your faces as well. Um, but I wanna say a special greeting to those of you who are in Charlotte, North Carolina, since this is hosted by IEEE Young Professionals Charlotte branch. 
Yeah, I and my family lived in Charlotte for almost seven years, and uh, that's how I became connected with some of the, the leaders of uh, the group here. And uh, it is one of our homes, so uh, special place in our hearts there. Um, and I know some of you maybe are students at, uh, at UNC Charlotte. I've been to the campus there, um, toured the engineering labs, electrical engineering, EPIC labs, et cetera. So uh, I'm connected to, to Charlotte crew. But we've opened this up to folks from all around the country, other young professionals, chapters, and uh, some of my own followers at Power Transformations. I'm seeing a good variety here in the chat of uh, um, Florida, Chicago, Pennsylvania, Toronto, uh, North Carolina, Texas. Uh, let's see, a good number from Charlotte that's expected. So uh, years of experience, I'm seeing anywhere from uh, two to seven years. So that fits in very nicely with the young professionals crowd. Um, I believe IEEE defines that as your first 15 years in the industry. So I literally just stopped being a young professional. Um, uh, I just reached the 15 year mark myself. Um, so uh, I recognize uh, some of you may be like me, protection and control engineers in the electric power industry, but many of you could be in other fields of electrical engineering as well. So I'm gonna teach you today some of the principles and concepts and things I've experienced uh, in this area of development and mentoring in my own niche professional field of protection and control. But I believe they're just as relevant to you if you're in telecommunications or electronics or whatever field of IEEE um, that you work in. Uh, on that matter, actually, so we can get to know our audience, can you also type in the Zoom chat? Um, great participation the first time around. Uh, what field of electrical engineering do you work in? I'd love to get a feel for our audience and, uh, um, and for you to get to know one another in this session. I'm not gonna come to you today with death by PowerPoint. I want this to be uh, engaging. Uh, so rather than distract you with things to read on slides, I want you to focus in on the discussion, but I encourage you to have a pen and paper and take notes. Uh, or type notes, whatever helps you to follow along, to stay engaged in the discussion. Um, and, uh, and I'm gonna, again, encourage you to ask questions throughout. So uh, I see robotics, power electronics, uh, looks like electromagnetics. Here's another PNC engineer, great to have you, uh, power, solar, renewables. So uh, a variety of different fields within electrical engineering. Uh, maybe a little biased towards, uh, towards the power side, power system sides, given that's my own background. But again, this is relevant for all of you. So I'm going to share with you today my top 10 tips for young professional development. That's kind of be the flow to our time today, starting with some of the areas of why, the, the kind of the heart behind professional development and investing in your own growth, and then transitioning into some of the hows the practical recommendations and tips for ways that you can pursue and go after those uh, career development goals that you have for yourselves. And then in some concluding points at the end, uh, I'm gonna focus in on, uh, on the topic of mentoring, mentorship, and uh, encouraging you both finding a mentor and being and serving as a mentor to others. So that's kind of where we're headed with our discussion today. I hope you're all as excited as I am to dive in together to our first tip number one. And that is that you must own your own development. Play on words there. Uh, you must take ownership of your growth for yourselves. Um, you got to take the bull by the horns, as they say. You've got to have your own initiative. Uh, you must drive your own desired career path. Uh, you can't sit back and wait for someone else to do it for you. Uh, you no longer have a college professor or, a, or a, an academic system to, to guide you. Uh, you can't even depend on your own employer or management team oftentimes. Uh, I wish I could say that was the case, but I've seen in my 15 years in industry that oftentimes that is not the case either for my own employers I've worked for or for uh, many of my students who I've coached and, uh, and mentored through the years at, at their firms and, uh, and companies. Um, a few different dynamics as to why I think this is the case. And I'm not here to bash 
employers, okay? I want to encourage us and call us up to, uh, to um, take initiative here. But uh, just to give you some understanding, maybe even some compassion and sympathy for your supervisor or manager, perhaps, um, I I've seen in most corporations, managers are typically pretty busy people. And uh, they sometimes feel overwhelmed by their responsibilities and uh, constantly fighting fires. You know, they call it the tyranny of the urgent, right? Um, I've been a manager myself uh, in corporate America life uh, for a number of years. I climbed the ladder through from supervisor to manager to vice president level. So uh, I understand those, uh, those struggles. But, uh, you know, training and development is a long-term game. It is, uh, doesn't fit the urgent category typically. And so uh, I think what you'll find is that it doesn't oftentimes rise to the top of the stack of a manager's priorities. Um, uh, I've seen uh, all too often, uh, maybe it comes up once a year in an annual performance review cycle uh, from your employer, uh, kind of checking in with you, asking you what are some of your goals trying to figure out some ways to help you pursue those. But even in that performance review cycle, they are oftentimes asking you to come up with your own goals for yourself. So it's, uh, it's kind of you steering the ship here and they're there to support you and help you along the way to give you some resources to assist you. But it's really your responsibility to take ownership of your own development. Um, so uh, I've seen a few companies with a top-down leadership structure where, uh, where the higher level executives really have a focus on training and development, uh, making that a priority for their mid and lower level uh, management team to, to keep that at the forefront of their minds. That's a really healthy environment when you are part of that kind of a, a culture. But uh, more often, I'm afraid I see it be more of a bottoms up approach to where each of you as young professionals need to take ownership over your own development. And you need to escalate requests to your leaders to up the chain of command, however high you need to go at times to, uh, um, to drive that happening. Uh, you know, you are best suited to come up with your own long-term development goals because you know your likes and your dislikes, you know, your, your own personality, your strengths and your weaknesses. You know the areas that you want to be stretched and grow in and uh, you can paint a picture in your mind, a, a vision of where you wanna find yourself in five or 10 years ahead down the road long-term. You know, typically your management is gonna be looking at just the, the shorter term current job functions where you find yourself today. You're gonna to have to zoom out and uh, look ahead down the road a ways. Uh, and target what is your next right step heading in that direction. So uh, I've seen the best results in this uh, journey of development come from students who are hungry and eager to learn and grow, who are, are desiring to develop themselves. You know, they are there on their own initiative. Uh, they're self-invested. Oftentimes they're willing to invest of their own time maybe even nights and weekends if required beyond and above and beyond your 40 uh, or more hour work week, uh, typically. Uh, they've even self-invested of their own personal budget uh, if their employer maybe isn't willing or able to sponsor them for the fees and expenses of that training opportunity. Uh, so they are really got a vested interest in, in owning their own success. Uh, they, won't, they weren't told to be there by their boss. So that is uh, point number one, tip number one, you must own your own development. So then number two, you must develop your own development plan. And so uh, I'm not restating the same thing here. What I mean is uh, you're not gonna be handed a plan typically to say, you know, when you're in college, you have a, a course curriculum which says, uh, here's the list of classes we offer and you take this one and then that one, there's a prerequisite, there's a logical progression from junior to senior, freshman to senior years, et cetera. And even when you sit down and start one new course in a given semester, that professor is gonna hand you a syllabus 
and say, uh, here's what we're going to cover, the material, the topics we're going to um, we're going to learn in this course. Here's kind of the sequencing of those topics, et cetera. So in academia, when you're in the university college model or, or even before that in, uh, in primary school, uh, you're used to someone else telling you, here's what you're going to learn. But that's not how it is as a young professional. Uh, here, uh, you need to uh, define your own course. You need to develop your own plan. So uh, what does that look like? Uh, you kind of starting with a blank slate when you graduate, you enter industry, your first job, where do you start? Um, you know, every individual is unique, uh, a unique person. So you need to custom tailor your path to your own interests and passions. You know, that's one of the beauties of, of uh, post- uh, academia is that you get to uh, you get the freedom to steer your own course, but it also comes with sometimes a little bit of uncertainty initially. Like how do I how do I do this? How do I go about this? So that's what we're gathered here together today to to learn some more tips on. Um, so you want to start with your vision for the longer term. You want to look out five or ten years, maybe. Uh, oftentimes our minds can maybe only grasp about five years out uh, maximum range. And I call in that long term, five to 10 years out. And start with just, you're not going to know the details of that, but you're going to have a high level picture of what you might want to, where you might want to see yourself at that time down the road. And then from there, you're going to uh, be able to zoom in and get a little more clearer perspective on the shorter term, on the next one, two year time frame, And, uh, you know, I think that's about as practical as you can really be establishing deliberate steps is in that one to two year time frame. Um, you can start to ask yourself, what practical skills do I need to obtain to be able to do my current job better? You, know, you can evaluate, here's my current job description and duties. Here's the type of task and responsibilities of this current job role in my current organization. There, you're bound to evaluate and find some gaps, even in your current assignment, not even yet thinking towards future assignments down the road. Um, so you need to start to identify those gaps and to be able to uh, search out solutions to fill those gaps. You want to uh, be able to pursue resources of various kinds, which we'll talk about in the how section. Um, you're gonna to want to identify what is my next step? You know, I'm currently here, but where am I headed next? Um, and I'm not talking about job hopping here necessarily from company to company sort of thing. I, in fact, I encourage people to try to stay in the same organization longer term, but hopefully, your organization allows you opportunities to shift around to various roles within the company to give you opportunities to stretch and grow and, and tackle new challenges and continue uh, um, developing yourself uh, within the company. But if at any time you find you're stuck and you're trapped and you don't have those opportunities to grow where you're at, perhaps it's time to be replanted to a new pot, uh, to give you an analogy there, right? But uh, um, always try where you're at first is my encouragement. Um, sometimes you might need to approach your management. Uh, a lot of times maybe uh, bring them a specific training opportunity uh, before them. And uh, you do your research beforehand in advance and find some opportunities that would help you to close some of those gaps for your current role and for your next step role. Um, opportunities that are relevant to your position and your job duties. Um, and you need to request permission to attend that event. If it's on company time, is it going to be part of your timesheet 40 hours or are you gonna to need to make up that time later if they can't give you that option? But permission to, to invest the time necessary. And then maybe there's a fee, some budget requirement to participate in a training opportunity. I mean, for sure, take advantage of free resources out there too, 
like this IEEE section. Uh, but um, at the same time, uh, a lot of times uh, it does require some level of budget of varying degrees. Request your your uh, employer to sponsor you for those costs to invest into your development goals. Um, maybe you get a company credit card and charge it. Maybe you get reimbursed, whatever your process. But uh, I believe that the best of both worlds is uh, when the individual is taking the initiative and driving their learning and development and when the company is supporting and sponsoring that development. Uh, that's the best because it's not the company mandating or dictating you will take this, this, and this course and it becomes obligatory and you maybe don't want to be there or don't feel the same level of passion to be there. And so uh, I know in my family, I have three young kids. My wife and I, we homeschool our three children and uh, we get to see that firsthand that the most effective learning for them comes from it being student-led and guided uh, going with their interests and uh, rather than instructor dictated, um, they're more engaged, they're more attentive as learners um, in that experience. So you see, I'm a teacher both at home and at work. Um, so that's number two, you must develop your own development plan. Take ownership, develop a plan. Number three, so I haven't seen any questions come in yet. Again, reminder, feel free to ask questions along the way in the context of what we're talking about. We kind of have some natural stopping points between each tip number. So it gives me an opportunity to check for questions and maybe answer them as they come in. So tip number three, to be successful at your given job assignment or more broadly to be successful within a certain professional career field or a niche, there's a certain core knowledge base which everyone in that field ought to possess. Some basic and fundamental competencies and skills that you need to master to work in that field successfully. You wanna to try to tackle those first if you're a new college grad or a fairly new first, I don't know, three, first few years in industry, you need to discover what is that core knowledge base in your given field or specialty um, that you've chosen to pursue. Um, a lot of times, unfortunately, it's not written down for you. Um, it's not really captured in a thoughtful or a thorough manner, but it's still true. It's kind of like a, a tribal knowledge of sorts. Uh, if you hang out with a bunch of senior engineers uh, in your field, experts in your field, they'll kind of know what it is in the back of their heads, but perhaps they've never captured those thoughts, gathered it together um, to help a young person that's newly entering that field to know what they need to know. Um, but one thing I've seen true in my own field, perhaps in yours too, is that there's oftentimes a shortage of those senior experienced engineers to, uh, to turn to. Uh, you know, there's a, a generational situation, at least in the US-based workforce. I know we've got a few international folks listening in, maybe in other places too, but in the US population, there's something, the baby boomers that are retiring or recently retired, soon to retire, they're kind of on the way out the door, starting to check out perhaps at times. And then there's the fresh crop, large influx of junior level engineers that I'm seeing coming into my field and perhaps other fields in the US electrical engineering uh, market as well. and. Uh, they're coming in fresh with no knowledge base, no lessons learned, no experience, and they're walking out and there's this gap that how do we successfully take the, the years of valuable insight and perspective from those senior folks and instill it into those junior folks in a pretty quick order of time because they're gonna be out the door if they're not already. So uh, if you have an opportunity, you need to sit down with a senior person in your field. You need to ask them to, uh, and be ready to write down some good notes while you're listening. Uh, ask them, what are the most important areas that I need to focus my learning on uh, to get me started off in the right direction? To uh, What do I need to learn? Um, you don't know what you don't know. 
right? Uh, and you need someone who's already been down this path, this road before you to help guide you. And so uh, maybe ideally there might be a textbook you could turn to that would have it all captured or a, a reference manual some that could uh, point you to uh, as a go-to authority on your field. Maybe that exists in some fields. Uh, I've struggled to find it in uh, my own field. Um, I think typically the best answer to that question of what is the core knowledge base might come from a compilation of various resources and various people within your industry. Um, and so learn what are the core competencies of your field, of your niche or niche of your industry and begin to formulate that and develop that, uh, that plan around those to start with. I mean, there's always more directions you can head later, but begin with those basics, with those fundamentals uh, that you need to possess. So that's number three. Uh, uh, Pankaj is asking, where do you look for an experienced person who can help and guide you in a career development plan? Um, identifying core skills in your domain? That's a great question, Pankaj. I think I'm gonna answer that question a little later on in the context of the discussion on uh, mentoring. So stay tuned. If I don't answer that, if you don't feel like I answer that fully, uh, feel free to jump back in there later on. Um, Geraldine is asking, should I um, be a specialist or a generalist in my career? Hmm, that's a great question. Um, I think that's an aim. Should I aim to be a specialist or a generalist? Yep. Yes, uh, should I aim? So uh, I have that discussion with a lot of folks in my coaching calls. Uh, there's kind of uh, two competing interests there to, uh, to get uh, breadth or to get depth. And uh, I think there's value in both, but you don't want to be so deep and not broad, but you also don't want to be so broad and not deep in any of them. You don't want to be a jack of all trades and a master of none. Uh, but you also don't want to specialize and niche in so deep in one area that you get stuck into that one area for the rest of your 30, 40 years, 50 years career. Uh, I think it's good to diversify. Um, and I, um, I've found it helpful to myself to, to kind of grow a level of depth in one area and then shift over to another area and grow another level of depth there. And then if I feel like I've reached deep enough to shift over to another and grow depth there. So I'm kind of gaining breadth and depth over time uh, is probably my recommended path. Um, someone else, come all ask a PhD study usually narrows down the area of expertise. Uh, how does it impact in the job market in general? You're, you're right that in a academic dissertation or a, uh, a master's thesis exercise, you're kind of focusing in on one area and you're going deeper in that one area. But what I typically find is that the area you do your research on in college is probably not where you're gonna spend the rest of your career. In. It's more about the experience of that first time. And then when you get a job, you're probably gonna do something, maybe it's interrelated, maybe you get an opportunity to go deeper in that area you studied or research, but a lot of times it's just, a launching pad to, to get you into industry. And from there, you begin your own journey of self-initiated learning, um, whatever the needs of your, of your job and industry. Um, I'm gonna keep moving forward. I'll get back to some questions again after another point or two. Um, so point number four, tip number four, they don't teach you everything you need to know in college, kind of connected to that question about the PhD. Uh, you know, I've, I've seen students uh, step out with that misconception uh, um, coming from academia to industry. You, know, you can only cover a very broad or high level hitting on different subjects within uh, an academic setting. You can get very foundational materials that are core concepts uh, that they have to be applicable to a very broad number of fields. You know, we're all electrical engineers. This is IEEE, Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. But even within electrical engineering, there's so many domains and specialties, right? And so the, the, the courses they develop in academia must be relevant to 
almost all of those domains. Sure, you get a little bit of choice with electives or maybe an emphasis area towards the end of your bachelor's. But even when you go into a, a graduate program, a master's, a PhD, you're certainly niching down a little bit further. But I've seen that uh, even then, uh, a lot of universities don't offer uh, an adequate level of coursework in any given specialty within. So uh, I'm an electrical engineer. I emphasized in power systems in my undergraduate program. I took some master's courses as well. And, uh, and so sure, my junior, senior, and, and master's coursework um, was relevant to power systems in large part. I did some undergraduate research in power systems, certainly helpful starts. But uh, I've seen that uh, protection and control, that's my, my niche specialty. You might get one course in that if you're lucky. A lot of universities don't have any protection courses in their electrical engineering curriculum. Some universities don't have power systems uh, emphasis areas. It, it all depends, right? Um, and so uh, you can't teach everything you need to know in college. What I've seen is that students come out, enter industry, and then all of a sudden their eyes are awakened to, wow, there's so much I don't know and still have yet to learn. And, uh, you know, I can testify myself after 15 years working in industry in my particular field, um, both from my own journey and from hiring and recruiting junior engineers fresh out of college to join my team and work with me. Um, I can testify that uh, uh, there's a lot of gaps there. <laughs> and uh, I found that my co-ops and my internship experiences and, and my university days were maybe sometimes more valuable, more beneficial, more relevant to be able to get practical on the job skills that really helped thrust me forward into a, a successful first full-time job opportunity after graduation. Uh, than per, a particular course that I took in college. So uh, that's an important tip to realize and recognize um, that your learning doesn't stop when you graduate from college. I guess that's tip number five. That's uh, kind of uh, related to number four, but um, in my coaching sessions, I sometimes uh, meet with students who are still in college and they're like, oh yeah, I took that course on protection. I'm, I'm good on that. And uh, they think, I guess it's showing how naive they still are, right? Uh, um, again, I've been working at this field of protection and control for 15 years now. And there's not a week that goes by that I don't learn something new. It continues to this day. And uh, what I've observed is that the more you know, the more you start to recognize the more you don't know. <laughs> the, it's kind of like peeling back the onions of a layer, uh, uh, the layers of an onion, and you you're, think you master something, you learn something to some level of depth, and then you realize there's, there's more deeper. And then there's another layer deeper below that and another layer below that. Um, eventually, you're going to converge on some core electrical phenomena, scientific uh, principle, or mathematical proof uh, down at the lower layers, right? Uh, everything applied can tie back to those fundamentals that we learned in a college uh, course setting. But uh, I think what I've observed is that the first time you encounter something, you don't usually have enough time to mine the depths of it. Um, and you don't even have enough understanding and clarity on that subject yet to understand the deeper levels. So you do the best you can the first time you encountered it on a real life project application. You, uh, you start to, to learn some level and you do the best you can. You maybe ask questions, but you're kind of counting on a, a more senior experienced person to, to catch some mistakes or some oversight, things you weren't even aware of uh, in that first pass or two. But uh, then what happens is maybe a few months later, or a few years later, sometimes you come back and you re-encounter a similar area. And this next time you, you already start with a, a step ahead from the first encounter. 
And so then you're able to have some time and bandwidth to go a little bit deeper, that next pass. And then you circle back around and some time later and you encounter it again and you go a little bit deeper. Uh, so each time you uh, re-encounter uh, these different technical subject areas, you're, it's like you're peeling back more layers of the onion step by step. Um, I love that digging process. There's something in me that is like uh, inquisitive and wondering, seeking to discover and to learn and to grow, to, to know more. And a lot of times I have to pull myself back even because I'm finding these other layers and I'm like, I'd love to go there, but I don't have the time to in this current project assignment. And you almost have to table that for okay, I'll have an opportunity down the road to do it. Here's the level I need to go to today or this current project to uh, sufficiently do the work with, with uh, to do it right, right? <laughs> and the next time you trust that you're gonna encounter the deeper levels later on. It's hard to do that sometimes to kind of stop yourself from chasing those rabbit trails. Um, besides the fact that you can go deeper and deeper, uh, the other side of the coin is that uh, your industry and your field is always developing and uh, technological advancements are continuing, ongoing. You have to stay current and relevant to the latest innovations, the state of the art techniques and approaches to your field. So that's another need for continuous learning. Um, so your learning doesn't stop when you graduate from college. That's point number five, tip number five. In fact, it's just beginning, okay? You must possess that lifelong love of learning um, to be successful in your field. You know, that's one of the core values that I established when I started my own firm, Power Transformations, uh, is the value, the core value of passion, which I define as the valuing the lifelong love of learning with enthusiasm and eager interest. You know, you, you approach something with excitement to learn it. Um, we welcome inquiry, discovery, and exploration. And so it's a, an ongoing continual learning process. So uh, now that you understand some of the heart behind your professional development, I'm gonna shift gears to uh, some of the practical tips on how you go about this. I see another question in the chat before we go there from Raphael. Can you share one or two examples of personal steps you took over your 15 years experience to develop yourself to where you are today? That's a great question, Raphael. Um, I think one important step I took was uh, pursuing a professional engineering licensure. I think that was a great um, milestone in my career development. I think it opened a lot of doors for me to step into leadership roles and different organizations and eventually to even be able to open my own firm um, independently uh, required that government regulatory approval to practice engineering independently or to oversee and lead a team of uh, engineers and training that were working under my leadership. Um, and so I think that's one key step that I would encourage everybody to pursue uh, as an engineer um, is professional engineering licensure. Um, another step, uh, I'll, I'll think back to another one, maybe share later on, but that's, that's a great first one that comes to my mind quickly. So let's go into the how, some of the practical tips. Uh, we're kind of halfway through our 10 points. Point number six, tip number six, uh, you got to have um, both tech, this is a brief aside first, you got to have both technical skills and non-technical skills, uh, soft skills. Uh, I believe that both of those are equally important to your success and growth and development into uh, future opportunities in your, in your career path. But let's focus in first on the technical skills. So tip number six, read, read, read. <laughs> And uh, let's, we're at an IEEE gathering, so let's start there. Read IEEE standards and guides and articles, right? Uh, 
participate in IEEE activities such as this and technical ones. Uh, I've been a member for 15 years now since I was a, a student branch um, uh, vice president, president roles uh, uh, like uh, the chair role, right? And, uh, and I've stayed engaged ever since because uh, I think it's helpful to see, to, to, to learn what else is going on in your industry and in your field outside of just your current company or job. And it gives you opportunities to bump into people doing a variety of things within your industry. Um, it broadens your horizons and uh, gives you a bigger perspective than you could have just on your own. So I uh, definitely encourage IEEE participation is one way, um, but uh, read, read, read. What do I mean there uh, besides IEEE documents? Uh, um, tech papers or white papers that are oftentimes available in your industry and in your field from different product vendors. And so, uh, you know, they're working to train their customers in how to use their products. And oftentimes they write about it and give documentation to, to guide the users of those products for that particular industry. Um, they also are trying to establish themselves as an authority in their field, um, as a, to get you to purchase their products over their competitors. So you can have a variety of perspectives there. Um, for myself, uh, as a protection and control engineer, um, you might read tech papers from uh, Schweitzer Engineering Labs or GE or ABB or uh, Siemens. Those are some of the vendors uh, in my field that I, I run up against, SNC, uh, et cetera. Uh, there's quite a few that, uh, that give you those type of resources. Um, whatever your field is of electrical engineering, I'm sure there's equivalents of those uh, vendors. I do want to give you a word of warning, though, in this area of reading, and that's uh, be cautious with Google searches. You maybe heard that before, but uh, they can get you into trouble. Um, one, I think it can overwhelm you with too much information. You search a certain topic and you get 100 options that you could read, and you don't know which one to turn to. Um, but also uh, be careful who you trust out there on the World Wide Web. Perhaps there's some uh, misleading or inaccurate information. Uh, people that are posting on forum boards and maybe don't have uh, the proper insight. Uh, so uh, just be careful with that. Uh, how do you know what, who you can trust, right? Uh, and even sometimes I've seen if I read two forum boards on a certain topic, you might get two different answers, which one's right. Um, so uh, just be cautious there. Um, I've personally had to fight this battle over my 15 years to, uh, uh, of figuring out what to read. And you know, what I've done is I've read countless tech papers in my industry um, on various subjects within my field. And it's allowed me to go deeper on these different levels of understanding, kind of peeling back the onion, right? But uh, I found some tech papers have been really helpful to me. Some textbooks or, or manuals out there have been helpful, but I found others that were maybe were a complete waste of time or difficult to understand, not well written. Um, what I've done is as I encounter these papers, the good ones I save. And I have a file structure system where I've got different folders to where I can save a paper on this topic or I can save a paper on that topic and keep it organized and kind of develop my own library over time of relevant tech papers, sorted out and organized. Uh, and then when I need to go back and reference something, I can easily dig it back up from that structure. And I've continued to build on that year over year. I keep it on a Google Drive now, so it's not on my employer's uh, laptop if you happen to change employers at some point in your time. Um, but uh, I, it's helpful to have that kind of uh, a library to pick from, but it also helps for you to have someone to turn to, maybe someone that's uh, ahead of you and has already read some of those papers and figured out the good ones from the bad ones and can point you in the right direction and say, oh, you're trying to learn such and such a subject. You know, I really found this paper helpful to deepen my own understanding on that subject. Here's the title of it, or here's the author. Here's a link to it. 
go read it. Um, so I'm kind of giving you a head start towards thinking about mentorship there, right? Uh, in the context of reading, or even after you read something, uh, you're probably gonna have some follow-up questions and you typically can't reach out to the author directly uh, to ask them. Perhaps you can try to connect with them on LinkedIn and ask them, but uh, no guarantees you get a response, right? You need to have somebody you can turn to even as you do that deeper dive reading uh, to clarify anything that you're not understanding. Um, and, uh, you know, I find that if you're a more senior person on the line, uh, when you point somebody to a, a tech paper they can read, what it does is it allows them to go back, do their homework, digest it a little bit. And then when they come back to me, they're more equipped to ask the right questions. And so uh, it's, it's a efficiency gain there. Your senior engineers are, have precious time. You know, they're oftentimes overloaded with work. Uh, there's a lot of junior engineers reporting to one senior engineer. Uh, that's a way that you can really uh, save some of their time by, by doing your homework and reading, asking them for a guidance on which paper to read, and then coming back with your follow-up questions to them after you've read it. Uh, it's going to make your interactions with them more meaningful and fruitful. <clears throat> um, I find that uh, the more things... Uh, uh, one last point on reading, I find there's more things to read than I have time to read, um, kind of like that going deeper concept, right? And so I also have a folder in my structure where I table, oh, I encountered this paper, or I, I heard about this paper, or I got this email, marketing email about this reading opportunity, and I don't have time to read it right now. So I'm going to download it, I'm going to save it in this future reading folder. And uh, you probably could set aside a, a block of time on your calendar each week, maybe 30 minutes, maybe part of a lunch break, one day a week or something to, to dedicate and focus on working through reading some of that backlog of future reading opportunities. Uh, I find if you don't plan for it to happen intentionally, you likely won't follow through on that goal or that desire that you set for yourself. All right, that's tip number six. Uh, I don't see any more questions yet, so I'll keep moving. Tip number seven is to network. What do I mean by that? Uh, find out the gathering points where others in your field come together. Maybe it's a conference. Maybe it's uh, an opportunity to sit down in a webinar or learn from an expert in your field. Um, networking with others who are uh, at your stage of development currently, but also beyond your current stage. You know, you want to be exposed to ideas that are beyond where you're currently at to grow. But you also, I feel, if you are only networking with people beyond your current level, you might be intimidated and uh, you might feel like, uh, it's over your head, the discussions, and you can't follow along. So I find it's helpful to, to have people engage with peers just as much as with um, experts. And uh, so you want to be a part of a community where you can gather and come around with others at multiple levels of experience. Um, you know, I've heard some of my students that have gone to conferences and they've shared how uh, everything was just who way over their head and they couldn't find it relevant and relatable. Um, and it just discouraged them actually when they participated in that event. So my encouragement to you is uh, make sure when you're searching out for these networking opportunities, these conference or virtual conference gathering opportunities to, uh, to make sure you pick something that has topics that are relatable and that you can connect them with your real life job opportunities. Um, you know, when you go to these events, if it's in person, hand your business cards out, make sure you have them printed and exchange contact information or send a V card over your phone. Or what I find most helpful nowadays is LinkedIn. Uh, I meet somebody and I look them up on LinkedIn immediately and I send them a connection request and it builds my library of connections. I'm up to three or 4,000, um, 
people in the protection uh, and control field on my LinkedIn now, just through uh, years of connecting and networking across the industry. You can even spend time going and searching for them <laughs> yourself if you, if you wish uh, um, to, to find others, uh, again, both peers and experts, um, but especially those that you come across and meet in person. Make sure you establish a connection so that you can reach back out to them maybe years down the road. If you think of something you remember they were an expert on that you could reach out to them for some guidance. Um, you know, in today's uh, post COVID pandemic world, we're in this kind of a virtual environment. So I can see some names and some faces, but uh, I don't have the same opportunity to chat with you afterwards uh, as you might in a, or breaks in a longer um, session. And there is value to that FaceTime opportunities uh, outside of the virtual world. But uh, if virtual is all you have, there's kind of pros and cons, right? Uh, in virtual, we can, we can reach across geographical barriers, right? And we can gather together across industry and around the world um, simultaneously. Um, but uh, that in-person gives you some added value perhaps. So my, my encouragement to you there is if you are in a virtual, you know, look at some names on the attendee list and uh, connect with them on LinkedIn perhaps, <laughs> or be a part of a community which has uh, some sort of a Q&A forum or a, a, a way for people to connect and interact and engage with one another around that common area of interest. And, you know, for myself, uh, a community of protection and control engineers that you can interact and engage with regularly. Um, perhaps it's a Q&A forum or a, a private LinkedIn or Facebook group, social media, a way to, to gather um, where you can bump up, to, up against others in your niche field. Um, so networking, huge encouragement to do that. Part of why is because uh, you're uh, in a moment, we're going to talk about mentoring. So you're, you're on the hunt to find you a good mentor and to be a mentor in those kind of networking environments. Uh, so I'm going to go through point number eight, tip number eight, uh, pretty quickly so we can get into the, the, th the final uh, focus on mentoring, which is kind of our primary purpose uh, at the end here. So number eight is uh, your best learning opportunities are what you get to apply on real life projects. You know, that's the best way to really solidify your learning. If you just take a class, if you just go through an exercise and uh, you don't get to live it out and walk it out and apply it, it's not as effective. There is some value to it, but applying it really allows you to solidify your learning and to, to deepen your understanding of that topic. You know, uh, some employers mentality around training is, we do OJT, on the job training. And uh, maybe there's some validity to that. Uh, it gives you opportunity to immediately apply what you learn on a project that you're actively encouraging, uh, encountering it with. But uh, I think uh, when you encounter something for the first time in your career, uh, where do you turn to for guidance and direction uh, to give you the competence and the confidence that you need to tackle that assignment, um, to be sure that you're going to do it the right way? Uh, that's why I believe there's kind of a place for both forms of training, a, a planned and structured, some predefined path uh, in a logical progression, like a training plan. But then there's also learning from the school of hard knocks of uh, living it out in real life, uh, gaining wisdom from a real life experience. And so, uh, you know, the best of both worlds, I think, is when someone experienced has intentionally developed and collected that core body of knowledge and skills into a curriculum for your professional niche that you can work through. And uh, hopefully, when you encounter it in real life, you still remember a lot of what you learned in that training program or plan. Um, but then also when you run up against things in real life to also have an experienced person to turn to 
to bounce questions off of and to, uh, to learn from, to seek their advice, to allow them to point you in the right direction on the front end, to kind of give you guidance, helpful guidance as you're working through it. And especially um, for a junior engineer in EIT to be able to review your work when you've done it and to make sure that your work has been sound and of good quality and excellence and to point out anything that was lacking in your understanding to allow you to learn from it, not to, not to squash you, oh, I found your mistakes, but uh, in, a, in an encouraging building up way to, uh, to do quality assurance or uh, quality control uh, as a learning process. Um, you know, when I developed my own training program for protection and control engineers, I structured in such a way that there's uh, currently there's 12 different course modules on um, commonly encountered fundamental subjects within the PNC field. So a student can uh, jump into any one of those modules as they are encountering it in a real life project. So if they go to do something for the first time in their career, they can dive right into that subject, learn the core competencies they need in that area to be able to immediately apply it on a project uh, instance. And so I think that's a, a valuable uh, thing to have at your disposal, a resource to be able to go to for that guidance you need when you need it. So that's tip number eight. I see a couple of chat questions uh, over time. Not everyone is willing or has the time to be a mentor. What are some resources or items to consider while looking for a mentor? Uh, great question. Uh, I'm going there right now. Uh, hopefully I'm gonna cover that. Um, how to establish a vision. This is from Banesh for the longer term. Uh, uh, factors to go into understanding where I want to be in 15 years. Let's talk about that uh, after the uh, last couple points here. That's a great question too. Um, hopefully, Banesh, you're keeping track of which ones I, uh, <laughs> I've answered and which ones are still pending. Um, so uh, number nine, tip number nine, we're, I recognize we're kind of uh, coming short on our time uh, planned here, but I'm going to press forward. Uh, find you a great mentor is tip number nine. And I've been kind of pointing you to the need for this along the way with these other, um, other tips you're kind of uh, seeing like, oh, that's the obvious answer to my need here, right? Uh, um, someone who can, uh, who you can turn to, uh, someone with experience. Uh, I find it's oftentimes best, uh, hopefully your supervisor or a manager in your organization is capable of being a mentor to you, of, of training you, Hopefully they have technical competence to be able to lead you effectively in your field. Um, but uh, I find a lot of times it's a good idea to not just have them as a mentor, but to have others who are outside of your direct chain of command as mentors that you can turn to for not just technical guidance, but even for uh, non-technical guidance. Like how do I handle this conflicting situation with colleagues or with a, a supervisor, et cetera? Uh, some of those soft skills uh, type things. So uh, you want to have both, those that are your official leaders and those that are unofficial mentors to you um, who have no obligation to, to, to do that for you other than uh, uh, being willing to serve and help. Um, that's why I believe there's a, a place for uh, both forms of training, like uh, a predefined path, Wait, excuse me, um, one sec. So mentors, uh, I find it's best uh, to have somebody that you can bounce your ideas off of, somebody that uh, you can share honestly with, you can open up and say, I'm really struggling with this particular concept or idea. Um, can you help me? Can you point me in the right direction? Can you give me some guidance? Can you point me to the right resources I need? Can you correct my misunderstandings here or clear my doubts in my head? Um, someone who is approachable, who, uh, who is willing to serve in that capacity to you. Um, you wanna find someone who you respect and admire 
both their technical competence and proficiency, but also their non-technical uh, things like their character and their leadership abilities. Uh, that's the type of person you want to be approaching as a mentor. You want to open yourself up to some level of accountability and follow-up from a mentor. You want to say, I'm really seeking to learn and grow in this area. Can you follow up with me and uh, uh, on a periodic basis or uh, circle back with me next month and kind of ask me, how's that going for you? Checking in. Uh, you know, your supervisor should be doing that with you, but it's good to have a mentor again, uh, who's not your direct chain of command doing that with you as well. You're giving them permission to ask some probing questions and ask some hard or difficult, tough questions um, about uh, your current position and your, your future goals. Um, I encourage you to write down a list of the people in your life who you could approach who might be able to serve as a mentor to you um, in your field. You know, approach them, invite them, take them out to lunch, pay for them, <laughs> and say, uh, you know, I really uh, respect your, your professional uh, abilities and uh, really admire the way that you've gone about your, your career. Um, I, would you be willing to, to serve as a mentor for me? I find that usually the mentor is not going to initiate it. Usually the mentee has to ask for it. Um, it's not going to just come to you. Uh, you've got to, again, it's focusing on taking ownership, being of initiative. So uh, tip number nine is find you a great mentor. And last but not least, tip number 10 is be a great mentor to others. I know you may be thinking, I'm a junior engineer. I'm a, I'm a young professional. Uh, who am I to serve in that capacity? It's never too early to start serving as a mentor. There's always someone a step or two behind you in your progression. Um, I challenge you as young professionals to begin serving as mentors immediately. No need to wait, okay? Uh, you can find an intern if you're a college grad. You can uh, go back to your alma mater or your local university and mentor people who are still in academia if you're new to industry. Um, or if you've got a year or two in industry, you've got other fresh college grads hopefully coming in and joining your company. And then you can serve as a mentor to them only a step or two behind you. Uh, you know, you may even be better suited to mentor them because you have a bunch of fresh lessons learned in your in yourself that uh, maybe a senior engineer is so far removed from and can't imagine themselves back in those shoes as easily. Um, but it's important you do tip number nine simultaneous or before tip 10, because you're gonna have questions come to you as you serve as a mentor that you still don't know the answer to as a young professional, and that's okay. It's good to say, I'm not sure about that. Um, let me, uh, inquire about that to my mentor and I'll get back to you, follow up on it. Um, it gives you an opportunity to continue your own learning and growth by serving in that capacity and by humbling yourself to admit you don't know everything, but by being willing to serve with what you do know and what you do already possess. I have a philosophy I call training for trainers where everybody has been entrusted with something that they are capable of taking and passing it along to others. And uh, it is your responsibility to do so. You don't receive an investment of training and mentorship just for the sake of yourself. It is to multiply yourself. It is to propagate it to others onwards. So uh, there's a vision for you of multiplication. Uh, you know, I've had an employee on my team come ask me as their manager, can you help me with this? I said, you know, I just taught this uh, a month ago to so-and-so. Go have them teach it to you. Because I found that there's no better way to learn something than to teach it. I know that's true of me as I prepare and teach my, my courses to the industry today. I'm still learning and growing as I prepare to teach 
even after 15 years of experience. So uh, I encourage you to take every opportunity you have to uh, sign up and volunteer for speaking engagements. Teach at a lunch and learn on something you encountered on a project with your colleagues, of, uh, um, et cetera. And uh, these types of serving as a mentor is helping you to grow in those non-technical areas. Remember, I told you it's just as important to grow in technical and non-technical uh, simultaneously. When you serve as a mentor, as a teacher, as a trainer, as you invest in others and pass along what you've learned to, to instill it into others, um, that is leadership development at its finest. It's helping to prepare you for a future supervisory role or a technical lead role on a project in your organization. Um, it's demonstrating to your leaders that you possess the skills and the, um, even before you have the title or the compensation, uh, that you are the right obvious next choice to promote into a, a future leadership need in the organization when it comes available. Um, I've seen that true in my own career, that as I was investing in others, that inevitably led to my promotions time and time again, as I continue to climb the ladder up the, the chain of, uh, of the structures. And now as I started my own business with an emphasis, uh, a focus of serving my industry and my niche PNC field of my industry, um, it's add as you add greater value to your employer, to your organization or to your industry, um, opportunities will open, doors will open, uh, you will grow and, uh, and to be being a leader in your field. So look for those opportunities to serve as a leader and as a mentor to your, uh, to your world, to your niche of the world, of the electrical engineering world. So those are 10 tips. In summary, let me encourage you with a few takeaways and I'm gonna hit the, the remaining questions and open the floor to any more questions. I'm gonna hang on a little longer, uh, but uh, spend some time and follow up to this session. Uh, remember I said the best way to learn something is to not just listen to it and, and, and keep it, but to apply it. And so uh, think through your own unique career path, your own goals, both the long-term and then narrow in on the shorter term you know, maybe say the next three to six months time frame. write down some practical goals for yourself. Write down a list of possible mentors. You don't know if you don't ask. Approach them one by one, or maybe think of who might be the right, the best fit, approach them first. They may say, no, I'm sorry, I don't have availability. I think somebody pointed at that. I'll, I'll hit on that question, uh, but have multiple names. If you don't know where to turn, I think I'll give you some tips on that. Uh, if there's nobody in your current sphere or circle where you can, who you could ask. Um, I want to kind of put a concluding point here on a, a LinkedIn post that uh, Mr. Banesh Kumar, uh, your IEEE Young Professional Charlotte Branch uh, uh, Chair, posted earlier this week on LinkedIn. And for this, I'm gonna do a quick screen share. If you can confirm that you can see my screen all right. Yep, we can see you, Josh. So uh, Banesh posted on LinkedIn, uh, this graph of continuous improvement. And it's the concept of 1% better every day. It's really the concept of exponential growth. And uh, you know, you heard all these tips from me today of uh, steps you can be taking, but you cannot simultaneously pursue all of that that I just encouraged you with. But what can you do? You can take one step tomorrow and you can take another step the next day and you can get 1% or better as this graph is showing you. But uh, the point being, it maybe seems intimidating if you look at uh, 15 years down the road, uh, if you're a fresh college grad versus where I'm at, 15 years later, but uh, you don't get here overnight. It's a journey, it's a long-term progression. 
of learning and growing and developing and maturing in your field, in your profession. And so uh, my encouragement to you is what's your right next step to take? One at a time, baby steps. And I assure you that what will happen is over time compounded on top of one another, you'll be able to look back and see, wow, look how far I've come this month or this year. And you'll be able to see some milestones and pr progressions and, and even career advancements and uh, promotions over time as you invest consistently and intentionally in your own development, as you craft your own development plan, as you uh, take steps faithfully, a little bit over time, grows and grows to see big leaps in the long run. So thank you, Banesh, for posting that to uh, uh, LinkedIn to uh, encourage us all. You see there's value in hanging out on those uh, social media platforms to encourage you to, uh, um, uh, to grow and develop professionally. I believe that uh, each of you have locked up inside of you a unique potential that's just waiting to be discovered and released to benefit the world and your niche of the industry, of your industry. Um, and this journey of development is an opportunity for you to live out that destiny, that purpose that each of you were created for, or your, your sense of, of fulfillment is going to come. I can testify there's been no greater fulfillment for me in my own career than the investment I have made into others. So you have to grow and develop first and be mentored first so you can get the opportunity and the privilege and the joy of teaching and training and mentoring others behind you in the years to come. So set that vision for your long term. I invite you to join me in this area of passion, of a lifelong love of learning and to be both a mentee and a mentor. Um, I'm going to look at the questions now, uh, the ones I skipped over or any new ones that come in. Uh, thank you for hanging a little longer um, than the planned time. Um, over time, so I'm gonna go back to Deep's question about uh, not everyone is willing or has the time to be a mentor. You're absolutely right about that. Um, unfortunately, I've seen some of the most uh, technically astute folks that are uh, the really deep nerds and uh, the top-notch experts oftentimes lack some of the people competencies to be able to have those EQ, soft skill, relatable, uh, um, able to, to dive into that type of a relationship with others in their field. Um, so uh, you need to find you somebody that is uh, not stuck up in their cubicle uh, with their head down, but somebody who is looking around, who also possesses technical competency. Uh, so your question is, what are some resources or items to consider while looking for a mentor? Uh, hopefully I answered some of those uh, along the way already, but uh, I think probably some of your best opportunities are gonna come. First, start with your own company, right? Start with your colleagues. Think if there's somebody at your organization. Another good thing is to think about your alma mater if you graduated from a particular university. Is there somebody else in your field that's come out of your university? There's oftentimes a sense of loyalty um, or in camaraderie with those fellow alumni uh, that maybe are practicing in your same field. Um, I know I found that helpful to me for uh, Go Clemson Tigers. Uh, <laughs> um, also, uh, as you go to these conferences or attend these events or these webinars or virtual events, et cetera, IEEE gatherings. Be on the lookout, be on the hunt to find you that mentor if you don't already have it. Uh, and if you don't know someone currently, don't just sit back and say, well, pity me, I don't have a mentor. I don't know anybody around me. You gotta put yourself in those opportunities to be able to surround yourself with people that could serve in that capacity. You know, you are, you become the people you hang around right? So you need to find people that are ahead of you and that can invest in you to be able to grow. Um, 
And then uh, I see Banesh question, uh, the longer term vision. What are some factors that go into understanding where I want to be in 15 years? I think my first encouragement, Banesh, is 15 years is probably too far out. Um, I don't know that I can wrap my mind around 15 years from now. I'll be at 30 years experience. So some people would consider that to be starting to think about retirement. Um, I think five to 10 years is a more realistic time frame to, uh, to yeah, say 10 years. Okay, I'll take that. So uh, if you're a, let's speak to the young professionals, okay? Uh, speak to those that are within their first five years in industry. Maybe you're an EIT, you don't even have a PE license yet. You're not in an official leadership capacity in your organization. I think one key area is not just to set goals for where you want to be technically in 10, five to 10 years, but where do you want to be professionally as far as um, a role in, in the industry? Do you wanna be a leader? And if so, what type of leadership do you want to aspire to, to reach? Do you wanna be a technical leader? That's respectable. Do you wanna be a managerial leader, a supervisor? That's great too. You better work on those people skills just as much as those technical skills. Do you wanna be a project manager? Maybe you better start to get engaged in some of the business side of things and uh, scheduling and, and estimating and budgeting and tracking progress and coordinating the, uh, the efforts of others on your team, um, et cetera. Um, so those are some uh, things to, do you wanna start your own company in 10 or 15 years? I guess that's a question you could ask yourself if you aspire to. I don't know that I set about that for myself 10 years ago, to be honest. I don't think I had that in my sights yet. Um, but maybe it is for you already. Maybe you know you're entrepreneurial and you and you desire that for for the future at some point in your in your journey. Um, I think you need to identify not the specific details of what company am I going to be working for in ten years, but what do I want my job function to look like, um, especially from a leadership perspective. Um, I believe that everybody is called to be some type of a leader. That's why I say uh, that we are uh, training and mentoring the protection and control leaders of tomorrow through uh, power transformations is because uh, everybody's got some potential to, to lead in some capacity. Um, I guess if you're, uh, if you're married, ask your spouse. <laughs> That'd be a good uh, tip or recommendation uh, to, uh, I know, my wife uh, does a better job at, uh, at seeing the future long-term than I do at times. So uh, bounce ideas off of those that are near and dear to you, maybe your parents or others that know you well or have served in, as mentors to you, maybe outside of the professional sphere and ask their opinion and bounce ideas off of them to, to, to gain some clarity for your long-term goals um, for your profession as well. Hopefully that answers your question there. I, uh, I think I've covered all the questions on the Zoom chat, but uh, if you have any other questions, uh, y'all welcome you to unmute yourselves, uh, ask them uh, or type it in the Zoom chat if you prefer, but I'd love to hear your voices. If you have any follow-up questions that come to you afterwards, when you're thinking about and uh, processing all this, uh, feel free to reach out. I'll try to point you in the right direction. <laughs> um, Vanessa, you want to uh, close us out here? Thank you everybody for the opportunity to, uh, to shoot, speak with you today. I really hope this was encouraging, uh, spurring you on to, to your growth and development. Sure, yeah, uh, thanks Josh. Uh, one last question probably I have is like, if you would be willing to just send out some notes that you have based on the 10 points so we can like publish it. I think that'll be really helpful for people who couldn't take the notes right I the second. I thought of that uh, as well. Um, and I, I did think, uh, you know, it'd be good if I capture those 10 tips. I'm not gonna go into elaborate everything, yep. but at least 
to remind you of some of those key pointers. And uh, so I can't promise you a time frame on that, but uh, no worries. Take that action item and uh, and kind of gather those thoughts from my lecture notes and put it in a more of a presentable format that you could upload to uh, to your IEEE chapters uh, site. There, uh, I'll probably share it on my own company yeah. website and uh, LinkedIn forums as well. So yeah, that'd um, be great. Yeah, and, thanks. Uh, if you're, uh, I didn't mention this, but if you're a PNC engineer, I definitely. If you're like me, I invite you to join in this Power Transformations PNC learning community. And uh, if you're not a PNC engineer, I really hope there's something like that out there in your niche. Uh, if there's not, uh, start one. Take the initiative to uh, create a forum and a gathering place for others in your field uh, as well. So, All right. Yeah, thank you, Josh, for uh, this highly insightful session. Um, I think we got great tips for career growth and mentorship, especially coming from your experience, right? It's very valuable. It was very motivational, at least for me, as a young professional trying to navigate through the dark waters of the earlier career. Um, you know, especially once you get out of college, you realize it's, it's an ocean that you're trying to swim through, right? So it was very helpful. Um, so yeah, it'll be great if you can just share some of the notes at a later time. Uh, you mentioned about the gap between the academy and industry. Um, definitely our goal at IEEE, you know, young professionals to kind of act as a bridge um, between the gap, right? So we can narrow it down, if not close the gap. Uh, so we really appreciate you taking the time to host this session. Um, I know it went longer than expected, but uh, thanks for completing it out for us. Um, and for everyone else, yeah, thanks for your participation and interaction. Hope you learned a lot during the session um, you know we're planning to host a variety of events including technical professional development social networking events as well um, and also some industrial site tours so um, we're trying to do a mix of events um, our next session will be on uh, ev charging 101 basics it'll be at adam power in huntersville in north carolina and uh, the session after that will be on stress management uh, at workplace. So yeah, please feel free to reach out to me if you would like to be part of our community. And if you're interested in volunteering with us, we're definitely seeking for more volunteers. Um, and, uh, and our activities and events will be a mix of uh, in-person and virtual and sometimes a combination uh, that we are calling as hybrid to see if people can dial in into our in-person events. Um, and as far as our social media, we have a LinkedIn page and Instagram page that we started. Uh, so we'll be posting updates over there. So if you can follow us there, um, you know, that'll be helpful for you to keep uh, posted. So I'll just quickly send the links for our Instagram on the chat. So you can take a look and keep updated on our events. So yeah, again, thank you all for the participation. Well, thank you, Josh, for the well, session. Uh... Yep. One more thought, Banesh, uh, sure, to your point ahead. about uh, capturing my discussion. This is recorded session, and we will post the link to the recordings uh, following on the IEEE page, as well as my That's own uh, um, uh, portals. And so uh, perhaps if something was really helpful, you want to go back and listen to and take some better notes uh, on a section of it. Uh, That's a great idea, too. Yep. Yeah. Uh, thanks for bringing that up. I forgot to mention. So we'll be posting the recording in our IEEE YouTube channels as well as on Josh's um, company website. So um, yeah, thanks again for everyone. I think it was great participation and interaction. I uh, really appreciate you guys you know, sticking out on a Thursday evening. Um, hope to see you all in our next event. Have a great night. Thanks again, Josh. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.